Good morning. Um, nice to see everybody. Um, Dad is, believe it or not, even though he's sitting here very silently, very talkative. Um, he is profoundly deaf, however, and that came late in life, so he never learned to l read lips. So uh, our family has communicated with him on a whiteboard for many years now. Uh, it's kind of cute. I, I think it's made most of our handwriting terrible, though, because we have to write so quickly to him. So um, he was he was nervous uh, before coming here, just getting in front of people. So um, just know that he, he's feeling way more comfortable now that there aren't 400 people here. Thank you. Um, but you're you're the important ones. Um, so as far as communication, if you if you ask a question, I will write it out for him, and he'll he'll be able to speak very clearly. Um, if, however, b because of his deafness, it's a little difficult sometimes to hear uh, him pronounce his words. Um, I might help just translate a little bit or may at least make it clear for you what your answers are. Um, Ed's done a wonderful job of summarizing. Dad's ready to go. He wants me to shut up. Um, summarizing um, a lot of my dad's Pacific War Journal, which is a published journal. Um, and we can uh, provide you a link online so that you can look that up. It's something my, one of my elder brothers created recently. Um, and I think this information came from the journal, but it, it's a nice outline, uh, an introduction to dad uh, uh, as a whole. But um, to start, it's it's probably best if I throw a question right at him and just get the ball rolling. But if you understand the give and take, I got to write, and then he'll respond, and, and we'll get all that. Sound OK? Thank you. So, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm a little bit humble. I met a man here older than me, 97 years old, and he's sitting right there. I bow to you. How many served in the South Pacific? Am I the only one to serve in the South Pacific East Room? Uh, now you can't catch me in any fabrication. <laughs> Let's see now. There's a picture on the wall. That tells the whole story. Uh, a controversy between Douglas MacArthur, who was one hell of a general, and Admiral Housley, who was one hell of an animal. Over the simplification, they simplified the problem. MacArthur went on to become the military governor of Japan and did a wonderful job. And some say almost too much the Japanese and democracy. Am I speaking loud enough? Mm -hmm. Because we believe the battleship philosophy hit the wham wham. I mean, the bullets from the cannons and a battleship were the size of a pickup truck. And they hit the beach and they skid. They don't go 20 feet underneath. Well, the Japanese is dug. Yeah, can't go. 
of living quarters. But they're waiting for the invasion which took place in the, in the sea behind you. My ship, two and a half miles from the beach, two and a half miles. And somebody says, let them walk. They, they had earthquakes in Alaska and in the Pacific Rim, which moved the surface of the ocean and creating an obstacle for ships. Anchorage, Alaska, was one example. Ships can't dock in Anchorage anymore because they can't get there because of the earthquakes. So they go down Prince William Sound to a place called Whittier, take the train into Anchorage and Denali Park. Anyway. Can you imagine after heavy shelling from battleships, heavy cruisers and destroyers of Saipan and Dita Day that hit the beach boys? They couldn't get there. The anchor, my ship is one of those anchored out there and unloaded. And uh, there's the beach two and a half miles away from the destiny. Can you imagine up the jack of the box in the Japanese? There's the dragon. Honestly, it was over fuel day for the Japanese. They waited until 500 men, a thousand, finally walked on the beach and then opened fire. You couldn't walk in the sand, you walked on bodies, American bodies. It was a shocking experience of the difference of philosophy. MacArthur, in the meantime, had a separate invasion of Woodlock Island off the coast of New Guinea. He came with his troops and Woodlock troops. He only had one aircraft carrier. He had Springfield rifles in World War I. But he fought intelligently. A great general, until he made one big mistake. He underestimated the Chinese in Korea. Uh, there's somebody in this room was in a tugboat in Korea, right? Anyway, um, 27 miles off the coast of Korea, right? Into uh, China. Enemy territory. Back and forth, we shuttled from Townsville, Australia, to what I got. Now it's a bird sanctuary, but where it was, uh, they built a, an aircraft 
Yeah, it's a replica on the land, it would lie. So the place could return flights between the land there. Anyway, Osley never learned that it took more than a shelling. He had a big sign outside the, his port of Tulagi, where it says, kill jabs, kill more jabs, kill, kill, kill. And that was his philosophy. My God, they didn't have any such philosophy. Obviously, he was successful in getting back to the Philippines where he escaped from. But that's a shocking picture. I don't know how my son got hold of it, but that picture shows men with equipment walking and up to six feet of water to the beach. How impossible to imagine walking to the dead. Anyway, years later, I toast to them. And most of them are lying in peace in Arlington. But these were kids like me. I was only 20. But the difference between the two men is leaders. I mean, MacArthur, I served under an M2 intelligence, what, 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 a pompous old fire. He had a sergeant lace him up every day morning with a corset. And he said the Ramra. But old soldiers never die. They only fade away. It was what we gathered personalized. Anyway. Does anyway. anybody have a, a question, a specific question? Years was he in the active? I, I started. Too late. <laughs> hmm? And maybe what age was he when he enlisted? My mentor is uh, showing me. copies out here for the museum so the, almost two years active wartime duty I mean another two years back in the States where I ended up uh, on the staff of the Emperor in charge of the North Atlantic Command, Amphibious Training Command, you know, Hotel Nansen, Ocean View, Virginia. So, four and a half years total. If you don't mind, I'm going to ask how, how he enlisted. And then I couldn't wait to get out. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, I was in ROTC in the college. In fact, I was captain of the rifle team. I'm, 
or the child. I am. <laughs> I had dreams about how many things German crushed me to the dead. I didn't want to be in the army as a second lieutenant. So I, I played a lot of hockey in those days, and my left eye was semi-blind. I could see, but I couldn't get a commission in, in the Navy. But I got my master of powers papers at the age of 19 for the Bureau U.S. Department of Commerce, Bureau of Time, Maritime Affairs, Gasco Bay Headquarters. The first day was a written examination Second day, three retired tanker captains with the examining board of applicants for masses of papers. I was just one of many. But as I left the second day, I passed, obviously. He said, now you can be called Captain Barry Parkin for the rest of your life. So I went down to Navy headquarters and they sent me to the custom house in Portland, Maine. Down on Front Street, and I was interviewed by a Navy Lieutenant Commander in Intelligence for a classification called M2. This was a group of men from the waterfront in Portland who had been fishermen or charter people. I was one of those. I've been both a fisherman and a gentleman. So I enlisted. I didn't, I was very naive. I enlisted there. My dad came with me. I remember the scene. A very knowledgeable lieutenant commander was interviewing seafaring people. I was only one of well, 20 applicants. They accepted two. <laughs> I was one of the two. And for the rank of coxswain. And listen, man. Rather than be a second lieutenant in the 152nd Field Artillery out of Bangor. Or else I wouldn't be sitting here. And then the lieutenant commander had the prophecy. Of course, we can't guarantee anything. There is a war going on. So I reported in the Fargo building in Boston, who was quite near the old Howard Burlesque Theater in downtown Boston. And they, every morning, they'd, like a roll call, they go alphabetical for runs of my man's run. My man's run. I think uh, it's like 70% of all the ships were, were sunk by 
Luftwaffe, Germany. But he assigned me to a new type of ship called Landing Slow Target, LST, with landing ship tank. <laughs> and then in Little Creek, Virginia, and then Norfolk. And we headed out in the Pacific. That's where my story begins. But that was just the preliminary. So I, I appreciate the question. Uh, I would like to know what was your dad's reaction when he learned about Hiroshima bombing. <coughs> I'm deaf in both ears. Bum knee, broken shoulder, both two shoulders. Blind in the left eye. But I'm still in there. I have not yet to reach 97. But boy, I'm aiming for her. What was your reaction to the there is I think our predictions were at least a million men would be killed when we invade Japan. <coughs> we didn't lose a single soul. We dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. I didn't like it, but it saved American lives. I was sick and tired of seeing dead American boys. Mm How -hmm. <laughs> bloodthirsty as they come. Anyway, it's a short paragraph in my projected book. My son just retired, Scott. He's in the process of moving his son his house. Had a heart attack. They found him two hours later on the kitchen floor. But he had gone through my old trunk and found my diary. And he spent time putting the words together on the computer. And oh, I'm a dead of gratitude. He's the reason I'm here. And this one, too. Any other questions? But, That was how I listed. And little did the lieutenant commander know. Oh yes, I was assigned to the Blue Nose schooner. It was a famous, famous racing schooner because Boyd Gal was brought in as a chief boatswain's mate. He was the skipper of the Victory Chimes and then the Georgia C. Bowden. I'm, I'm just asking him to, to tell us more about yeah. the LST, which does not stand for large, slow moving target. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what they used to say. The first mate is Anyway, assigned to an LST, we never heard of it. 115 men in the crew. That's a lot of men. 386 feet overall. 
flat bottom, no keel. But these ships were built to go up on the beach and the tanks or trucks roll off. In a paradise, I guess. But Osley fell after bombing, he would do just that. But he ended up walking on water. It was a 40% casualties. So the people you see hiking there were well, the way to set up camp because then the Japanese could take the equipment and use the equipment against the owners, which he did. So, uh, this where my story begins. LSD. Do you have a question? I just let him know there's a different photo up now, and it's a photo of a, an unknown. I know it. What is the idea? We carried the first Marine, average load, 500 men on one ship, for two or six ships. We were the first allies to the Pacific. Scott said, be sure to tell them about John F. Kennedy. There was nothing in there about John F. Kennedy. But John Kennedy skipped it like me. He's, he was a Lieutenant J.G. at that year. He never could tell. There's a picture of men with no shirts. The humidity in the South Pacific is intense. So, imagine a, a chow down, 500 for dinner, Jones. Jones was the cook. And he'd cook some mostly sticks. The beach. But having to make them have drinks and just come on by the time we were inside Ben. This is before Iwo Jima. It was an eye opener to me. How stupid can you be? Uh, my job as Chief Buses me was uh, I'd load the ship as fast as possible. And I was uh, give me hell, boys. And after the last man had left, the smell of vomit was all, all over the... These kids were going to their doom. And I think one of them was suspected. Somebody screwed up back there in Washington. Some graduate from Annapolis was looking at geodetic survey maps from 1936, which had nothing to do with 1943. Because I said earlier, the bottom had changed. We couldn't get there. Those kids had to walk two and a half miles. In the most water, but at the most three or four feet deep because of the bottom had changed. They were walking to their doomsday, walking to their death. So, 
the Woody Woods from Boston was a criminal lawyer. He was, he did one better than me. He went in at the most insane class. He was a yardsman. Our captain was uh, from a headmaster of a school, Philip Baxter. His name was Baker. The six LSDs left America. It's all in the booklet. No sense repeating that. Read it here in the museum. But these are said. Anyway, I cook was a genius. He used to cook fresh bread. I don't know how many in this room have been without bread for more than a week. Boy, do you miss it. And the smell of freshly cooked bread is wonderful. A P.T. Bow had, uh, didn't have a key, much of a kitchen. They certainly couldn't cook bread. So J.F.K. came alongside. He's P.T. Bow's were on the starboard side of a pier and Tulagi and the other trees and on the port side. He, he called me boats after he got to know me. He, Do I detect a, a down east main accent? I said, hey, yeah. I like lobster and steam clam. Then he started laughing. We became friends. I didn't know he was going to become president of the United States. Mm. So he didn't call me boats. I, I called him lieutenant. But he didn't wear a shirt either. He was skinny, wiry. Had something wrong with his back. But after the end, that accident. What? He swam seven miles through shark-infested water, yes, for help. He, he didn't know what to say to me, but JFK was here. We, we, I mean, Kilroy was here. JFK was here. Nobody knew that JFK was going to end up being the president. Actually, Scott, it's a fascinating to me you never mentioned it. I didn't mention it because... Uh, uh, uh. So I mentioned it here for the first time. Oh, she got the fresh bread. Yeah, I'm well, she got a chance to fill cigarettes. So I will give him fresh bread. His crew would get fresh batter and sit there and just munch away. Yum, 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 yum. <laughs> <laughs> I was quite a sight to see these warriors. Those warriors they were. I guess we all were. The crew squads, officer squads were up on deck. Off the, in the stern of the boat. I think one of the experiences I had I can share with you with girls. Warbar was uh, James Michener calls it the most beautiful island in the world. Well, we, our steering had broken, so we were hand steering down below, moving. And I was in the car 
Well, I have a skip is hard. In a bar bar. Oh, that smell. I know the smell of smell like that. Makes you pretty air. Flowers. Jungle. It would make a wonderful perfume. It was a farewell party to the free French governor. Where we was on the by the French Polynesian Islands. And the captain of each ship was invited by no enlisted men, but I was. If I had to go to I uh, took one LCVB landing grab vehicle was now to each ship because these caps all dressed up in the dress. Like this is dress. To a farewell dinner party for the free friend. He was going back and fight with the De Gaulle and friends. Well, they had like a, a Chautauqua, like a, a platform. I wish everybody in the village would dance. The moon came out, it was like a scene out of Voltaire. Anyway, oh, folks like me and my associate in the 90s, young men were taken by the Japanese. But dance! <laughs> in the end of the story, no, not yet. Because these girls were toppled. <laughs> a boy from Maine. To see this, my heavens, how shocking. My father was Methodist minister. Terrible. Well, I had bell bottoms, white. They knew me as a sailor. The other guys look like I do now. They're like a doorman in a park having a hotel. But they knew me. Jumped off the stage. Made a circle around me. Sailed like my granddaddy. Friend sailed. He not here. He teach me boogie woogie. He teach me jitterbug. You teach us. I said, I'm in heaven. <laughs> so I bent down, took my shoes off. Maybe I said, oh, we did. What a night. <laughs> then they, it was laughing. It was, but it was a beautiful scene. The, the, the smell. Well, that was what the South Pacific was, was really like. The rest of him, Grand Canal, Tulagi, the rest of around, with a gown off New Guinea, Monday, New Georgia, Vela Vela. Colin McGarra, Woodham, Augusta Bay, Bougainville, Saipan, Iwo Jima, we're all in the slot, the Solomons. I actually participated in the battle. Yes, bell. Nine bell. Others come from here. We bypassed by October. Like October, we were isolated. But anyway. I 
I didn't know where we were making history. And so I'm an island. And the Abin books are written about and about what I want to do with Chesterfield cigarettes. What happened was that on the way to Dominion, California, from Panama and Bora Bora, there was a cable sent and then confirmed by some of all, is there anyone in the crew of six LSTs, two submarine chasers, two destroyers, that was Afro Tatilla, that's had experience on a schooner. Well, like a damn fool I was. I raised my hand, never volunteer. <laughs> the idiot. This was terrible parking to take a bucket of seawater and I line, stir it, and line the sun. The captain must have black shoe polish. Do you hear the black shoe polish? I got nothing about my eyes. Because I was a sign. And they haven't do, but to go behind enemy lines and supply the bravest men I ever knew. Well, these men, mostly people who had worked on plantations, the Japanese lines, and mail, not mail, radio, Back to headquarters in Canada now. Flight of 125 airplanes approaching Canada now. 125. Yeah, I thought the war was uh, was that one side. That zero was the first little bugger. And the radio positions, and then moves Skidell, because they could get a fix. The radio man was doing more about this than me. They could fix the position and go and kill him. That's simple. My job was not let him get killed, to get in there, rescue the radio man and take him back to the ship, which I did. And the black shoe balls in my hair, my skin was, uh, I didn't know it was the beginning of skin cancer. You can't take a blonde, blue-eyed kid who was laying in the sun 120 degrees Fahrenheit through the zero flying under 500 feet, just see, just another fuzzy was he. I was acting skipper for one month and ten days. They had taken me off the ship in a wheelchair, making sure it was here, because my skin is opened up. And what they call jungle rot. My skin could not take uh, that punishment. So 65 years later, I go to Washington, D.C. from Brookfield with some veterans from, I don't know where anybody room to go. <coughs> I thought we were going to visit the White House, but it was when those two SOVs 
We were in North Dakota with, with the Hicks and closing all public parks, everything to do with the federal government, closing down. We something to do with the budget. But imagine it's a plane they flew us out. How expensive it's paid. We were supposed to go to the White House. We couldn't get there. There were tanks on the north, south, east, and west of the White House. Tanks. National Guard, but tanks. In America, my kids had to come from school uh, on the tours to visit Lincoln's Memorial. They couldn't see Lincoln. Crows, but out of the Senate of the United States. I really feel so deeply about it. They have the, the veterans walk back. Well, I, I couldn't take that. So I asked permission from the sergeant. I, put, I know so if I can have a few words. The kids were sitting on the stem. I don't know what you've been with. <laughs> so I told him that story. I didn't know my son was able to get those photographs from the census. I read you. Afterward, there was a guy there. Central Intelligence. And he said, would you mind repeating that little speech you gave? You really feel deeply about this. I said, yep, I sure do. Yeah, do. What those boys died for was not to, over a thousand kids unable to see. Yeah, when I was in high school, I had to memorize the letters to get the address four score and seven years ago. That's the way it's said. I mean, Abraham Lincoln was a great president. Anyway. Hey, boys, got any fresh bread today? That was John F. Kennedy. <laughs> well, did Charles write the, the diary totally when he was at sea, or...? The majority of it, yes. So Dad, hey, Dad kept a war journal. It's uh, amazing to me, you know, that I'm alive. Yeah. You, his handwriting is I know, my associate wants to feel the same thing. To, to take that All those kids did. The yeah. I just say, well, I read it to make it worthwhile. Are there any other questions I can write down for him? Has, has the VA taken care of your dad's medical needs over the years? Great question. I'll let him answer, but... Um, I got it, what are you saying? <laughs> Dad didn't use the VA at all until just a couple of years ago, and since then he's had no better care at all ever. He's had all private hospital and right. service since, but since he, he went to the VA, it has been unparalleled. Good. I'll tell you, it's been amazing. Great. Dad now lives in St. Paul's, which is a, a VA a nursing home in Denver. Uh, so they're, they're really taking care of him 24-7 now. Good. Yeah. It's a great question. Thank you. I might ask him that too, so. Um. What has your VA experience been? Hi, Van. 
until he died last week. If he had been with the VA hospital endeavor, I find the underrated, not overrated, underrated, are the wonderful doctors, dedicated doctors and nurses. They, they took me in, they had no room. <laughs> they moved in an office and, and took me in and saved my life. I'm strapped up now with a water bag. I don't like dying. I'm not afraid of it. But last week I couldn't breathe. Uh, I get in a nightmare, coughing, but they saved my life. <laughs> Actually, Benjamin Franklin, yes, Benjamin Franklin. Actually, uh, invented that. <laughs> he did. What? That's great. Nobody wants to see that, but okay. <laughs> Get that picture. That, that me live. I'm honored to see my granddaughter graduate from high school. And my grandson graduated from college. This is kind of nice. Um, Dad really didn't talk about his war experience until just a few years ago. Um, he started opening up, you know, in his, his later years, and um, he referenced it already. But he, he took the honor flight. It. He took uh, he took an honor flight just a few years ago, and it just completely opened him up. It was a, truly an incredible experience. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was so upset because the the week that they went, the government shut down. <laughs> so he couldn't, the, the crew that went that week couldn't get uh -huh. to most of the, oh, he was ticked. <laughs> he was ticked. So yeah, they were pulling <laughs> groups of... I think the wonderful thing that you had at the museum. Do you have any other questions? I mean, the Naval War Museum. Which has photographs of the LST. But anyway, you're welcome to use any of the photographs in the book. Here. And I hereby donate one of the. Oh, the Lord talk about a book. Oh, my son had a heart attack. Okay. He's back. He's slimmer than he was. But I wish he could be here. I think that's about it. I enjoy the privilege of being here. And that's my son Tom, putting this on film. And my son Lori, who gets things done, I mean, on time. I always know he's on time. My daughter loved me a lot. Kevin was not busting up fights in college. 
my son-in-law, Kevin, city councilman who instigated this, and all of you. I feel as though I know you. Thank you very much for having me. So any more questions for Charles or Lars? Before we, uh, before we leave for the day, I, I want to thank uh, Charles and Lars both and for the family and Tom, uh, our videographer. And, and uh, Tom is an accomplished videographer. I uh, just met Tom this morning. Uh, Tom, tell us what you're going to be doing later uh, with regard to your profession. Well, after this, I'm going to Columbine High School. We're uh, making a documentary about the, uh, the uh, Columbine High School football team, which the year following the tragedy, they actually went to state and won for the first time. So there's a little light at the end of that horrible tunnel. So um, we're going to start today. And thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, also, I'd like very much to present uh, Charles a, a Broomfield Bears Museum challenge coin, and also to Lars. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I say something? Yeah, please. Just, uh, very quickly, this museum, uh, sorry, it's quite a story and I was a bit moved by it, but frankly, this museum is a gem in Broomfield. This Veterans Museum is run on donations. It's City of Broomfield. I serve on the Broomfield City Council. It's Kevin Krieger. The City of Broomfield provides the space. But the museum is administered by volunteers and donations. I suspect most of you have been here before and have gone through it. But this museum draws veterans and volunteers from all the municipalities around us. North Glen, Thornton, Westminster. Because not every city has a veterans museum. And I don't think everybody realizes that. I am extraordinarily proud that the does have a veterans museum. And it's unreasonably well organized. I want to thank the volunteers that spent a tremendous amount of time organizing information, collecting and organizing artifacts, putting together diaries and information about speakers like Charles Parkin. They are amassing a very impressive library of information, not just the stuff in the cases, but uh, if you haven't happened to have walked around before, and I think most of you have, it's worth walking around and seeing how it's organized. I'm going to leave a donation in the jar out here by the sign-up sheet when I leave. This is run by donations. If there are people that are not volunteering here that could leave $20 or maybe 10 or 5 in there, I know it would be appreciated by the staff, but I just am tremendously proud that the city and county of Broomfield even has a veterans museum. And I thank you, and I thank Dave and Lou and all the other volunteers that make this happen. It didn't happen on its own. It happens with a lot of people coming in on Saturdays and other days to put things together and make it happen. I thank you, and I want to just applaud the that very much. All right. Thank you again for coming. It was a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you.